Welcome back, Senator Sear, to the Beacon Hill Beat. There's been lots going on in the state um, with so many different topics to discuss today. We're going to take the one that's on the top of everybody's mind, vaccinations. Uh, yes, Paula, good, good to be with you again. It's been, uh, it's been a long winter for sure. Um, we are finally seeing some, some real prox progress on, on the vaccination front. And this was something that was terribly frustrating at, at the outset. Um, you know, I've been pretty vocal about a number of the missteps that, um, you know, I really feel that the governor made in, in communicating vaccination. And I remember back in, in February and March, I mean, my office was getting so many calls and emails from people trying to trying to really figure out um, a system that, that wasn't thought through. We pulled together as a region, we've um, we formed a, a Cape Cod Regional Vaccine Consortium uh, made up of Barnesville County, Cape Cod Healthcare, community health centers like Harbor Health Services, uh, Outer Cape Health Services, um, High Ennis Fire Department, Town of Barnstable, to really ramp up vaccination on Cape Cod. And, and, and we've been quite successful in addition to, to other opportunities where folks can get vaccinated. Um, Cape Cod leads the state by far, Barnstable County. In Barnstable County, 50% of uh, the residents here um, have had have received uh, one dose, at least one dose of COVID-19, and 32% um, are fully vaccinated. Uh, the data is even better when you look at um, uh, population by age. 93% uh, of residents, 75 and older in Barnesville County, um, have had have received at, at least one dose. 84% um, for those 70 to 74, 79%, uh, 65 to 69, um, and so on. So you know, for, for the people we know are most vulnerable to COVID-19, if you look at the morbidity and mortality, you know, of the pandemic, you know, nationally, globally, but also here on Cape Cod, um, it's really those over, particularly over 75, who it is most adversely affected. Um, so that is good news. Um, we, we continue to be in, in a spike uh, of cases and, and really Barnstable and, and, and parts of Yarmouth have been the epicenter of this. Um, the case numbers do appear like they are, are, are plateauing or, or decreasing. So hopefully we're coming out of that spike. But really the data shows sort of, you know, twin stories. One, real success of vaccination, particularly among older adults, which you know are most vulnerable. And then also a real spike in cases, you know, of people my age, right in their 30s and their 20s and their 40s, high school students as well. Um, you know, and, and certainly the positivity rates have not been good. They are getting better. And so I'm I'm cautiously optimistic. Um, we do have, uh, I'm cautiously optimistic that the cases are decreasing. We're coming out of that spike. And if we keep up this vaccination rate, I'm increasingly confident that we'll have a good chunk of our population vaccinated before we get into the high season. That is really good news. Um, you know, we seem to uh, uh, believe that we're going to have a banner summer, um, you know, from all <laughs> indications. Uh, the Cape is open for business and will be um, really hopping uh, this particular. So what are some of the things that folks really need to know? You know, seasonal workers, vaccinations, uh, Monday actually opens up to everyone. What are some of the things that you want residents to really understand about the next coming few weeks coming forward? Because we really do want to prepare for the season, put our best foot forward. Well, we really continue to focus on the most vulnerable people uh, you know, in our community. And so that was first older adults. And now that's essential workers, right? We need to make sure that we're reaching, you know, the people who've been making, you know, our, our, our businesses hum, um, have been serving us through this pandemic and who are going to welcome so many people at, at the start of, you know, once the season gets underway. So that's where we're really focused. I do want to be honest that supply of vaccine that is coming to the county, that's coming to Cape Cod Healthcare, that's coming to the community health centers, that has been relatively stable. So once April 19th comes, you know, it may take a few weeks for folks to, to be able to get vaccine appointments. This is going to take a, a bit of time where we're really focused as a, as a consortium is on reaching those essential workers, because I think it's so important that we make sure that they're vaccinated. We've got a lot of, you know, that includes a lot of people of color, a lot of immigrants, a lot of people who may be here seasonally. And if we don't really work hard to get them vaccinated, I don't want to let them fall through the cracks. Um, so that's really the focus there. Uh, at the state level, um, the, the Senate president and the speaker actually created a new committee, uh, a joint committee on COVID-19 emergency management and response. Uh, and uh, I'm actually appointed on that committee. Uh, we've had a number of oversight hearings uh, already, uh, three already uh, since we just got underway. Uh, and so really trying to ask some, some pretty tough questions about 
you know, how do we get here? Why was the vaccine rollout so clunky? I think things have really improved. Massachusetts now is leading the country. That's good news. And then also getting a handle on, you know, where do we think the epidemic's going? Uh, you know, what, what potentially is the role of variants, you know, here in the spread that we're seeing. But I think that the next several weeks are going to be, you know, continue to vaccinate. We need to really get a handle, continue to get a handle on the spike in cases that we've seen, particularly, you know, in Barnesville. You guys in Barnesville have been awesome, doing a really good job, um, you know, trying to reach folks. And I know, Paula, you've been, been, a, been a big part of it. Um, but I am cautious optimistic as we go into the summer. If you look at summer 2020, we were able to welcome a heck of a lot more people here than I, I expected we would. And we saw pretty low cases. We did not see community spread occur last summer. So my aim is to make sure that if we can get as many people vaccinated before high season, uh, if people are following those public health protocols, right, wear that mask, wash your, you know, wash your hands, keep your distance, um, that will hopefully serve us well at, as the days get warmer. There's other things that go on in state government besides <laughs> the pandemic, COVID-19, and, and obviously the vaccination efforts, which we know take precedent just about over everything out there. But there's been some major major legislation that affects how we'll live in the future here on Cape Cod. Let's talk comment, uh, climate change, uh, Senator Sear. Uh, huge, huge news out of the state house. So, so, so this is major and, and, and for no other region in the state does the climate crisis pose such, such an existential threat, right? Um, just with rising seas alone, we're gonna have to change, you know, ch ch change how we live here, um, you know, in, in the coming decades. and. I've really been among a number of people, a chorus of people pushing for Massachusetts to get really serious about climate change. To do so, we need to get to net zero carbon emissions by 2050. Uh, and the Senate and the House, we actually passed legislation at the end of last year, the governor vetoed it. We came back this session, we took up this legislation, um, got it passed, worked out a few compromises, but not too many with the governor. And now that bill is signed into law. Um, it sets five-year emission targets every five years. So every five years, the state has to be looking at the emission targets um, and, and, and refining and make sure, making sure that we're meeting them. Um, we really prioritize solar. There's an expansion of, of offshore wind, uh, an additional 24 megawatts. Uh, Massachusetts is poised to, to lead the country in offshore wind development. I've actually filed a few more bills around how do we further expand offshore wind and how do we make sure that those jobs are staying here, either on Cape Cod or on Martha's Vineyard or Nantucket, particularly those maintenance jobs. Um, the climate change bill though sets new efficiency standards. Uh, and we really try to address solar and broaden solar access. So it's a pretty comprehensive package of the legislation. It's something we should be really proud about. And I think it's a piece of legislation too that was passed with bipartisan support. You know, I think people get it here in Massachusetts. You know, the climate crisis is not a partisan issue here. We're doing everything we can and you know, I think with this climate bill, and then hopefully, I think with some of these federal dollars, we're going to use it for um, climate resilience projects. That that you know, this is just sort of my idea. Sort of, it's, it needs to go through the process. But hopefully, we can take some of these billions um, that are coming in and direct that to climate resilience. And and, and this may, you know, hopefully, would add will add up to um, the level of, of of generational response that we need uh, with such a significant crisis. You talk about net zero. I'm just going to kind of like back up a little bit here. Sure. For the lay person that's out there, um, you know, net zero is is somewhat of a, a, a lofty um, goal here, right? Uh, how does it affect daily life? Um, you know, for myself, I have solar on my house um, through a Cape Lake uh, compact program. I am contemplating a electric vehicle, but there's not enough charging stations for me to feel comfortable yet. So how do regular everyday people kind of offset their carbon to get to net zero themselves? So the whole idea with net zero is an acknowledgement that um, we will have some carbon-based fuels both in the transition to a green economy and even when we have a green economy, there, there's going to be some need for that, right? So the goal is to um, basically at the end of the day, when you add up all the renewables, um, when you add up uh, carbon sequestration, right? And, and that happens, you know, not only in our forests, it happens in our salt marshes, it happens in our natural environment. When you add all that up, that's getting, you know, that's what gets you to that net zero. Um, this bill, by the way, Paula, expands um, charging stations and, and, and with the federal action as well, that's coming too. So, 
you know, add it all together, this is what it's going to take, you know, take for Massachusetts, you know, to get there in, in, in a pretty short time frame, right? We're talking about, you know, 30 years and, and counting. Um, the key here is that we need other states to follow Massachusetts lead. This is sort of first in the nation legislation. Um, and, you know, cautious, optimistic that's happening in, in, in some states and others it isn't. Um, really encouraged with the leadership we're seeing at the federal level in the Biden-Harris administration too. Uh, but this is a, this is really all hands on deck. If, if we don't address this, and we've been kicking this can down the road for a long time, um, people are not going to be able to live on Cape Cod and Martha's Vineyard and Nantucket, um, at least in the way that they're living now. And and if, if we don't make these changes, it's going to be even worse. Even if we do, even when we do, as we do make these changes, there's still it's still a big challenge and hurdle for us. Talking about big challenges and hurdles, um, what's the social equity piece of this and the racial disparities? You know, it's all well and good to buy an electric vehicle, but what about transportation for, you know, those neighborhoods and those uh, communities of color that really don't have a lot of skin in the game here? Um, how does that work into social justice and, and, and climate change? So there, there's a several provisions in this bill or now this law that actually look at environmental justice communities so making sure that there's extra scrutiny from the state when certain projects um are, are being built in, in in communities of color and immigrant communities um you know i think more broadly right if you look at covid19 covid19 has really revealed the the disparities we have in our commonwealth and the racial disparities we have in our own backyard um you know white white folks here on cape cod are, are twice as likely to have received a dose of vaccine um, than, than black folks. Um, you know, if you look at uh, morbidity and mortality data, black residents on Cape Cod uh, are three times more likely to have contracted COVID-19 than their white counterparts. So even the pandemic has really revealed the, 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 the racial injustice that we have in our own backyard. I see how a lot of this manifests, and I think it's really manifest through housing. Um, Cape Cod has that, this red hot real estate market. It's being fueled by certainly um, the desire for folks to have a, a piece of Cape Cod, right? That second or third home. Um, but it's really meant some really alarming trends for those of us who, who aren't millionaires and billionaires. Um, you know, property values here uh, have risen 19% in, in a year. The, the value of a single home, family home is even is even more. It's increased to it's increased by 24%. Um, you know, an average of $540,000 for a single family home. That's the median price. That really continues to squeeze out younger people, um, uh, people who are in Im our immigrant workforce, many of whom are people of color. And so when we look at housing and how housing sort of manifests here, it really is a space that I think, you know, in addition to climate change is the other issue we've got to get serious about. Um, yes, because, you know, there's some real injustice that's happening, but also, you know, this is an employment and a workforce issue. The number one challenge that I hear from the business community is around workforce. Well, well, our housing market and and frankly, our our um, you know our inability, the fact that we haven't kept up with housing production here, um, and we're really not building broadly, we're not building the kind of housing stock that's going to be attainable for you know someone who works in, in the local restaurant industry, right, or or even someone who who's in an entry level job in, in a municipality. Um, you know, we haven't been doing that. And I think we really need to step up on housing production, um, you know, and we need to do so in a way that that's green, right? We've got to make sure that, you know, what we're building is also, uh, you know, also meets sort of the, the spirit of, of what we're trying to do around net zero. I think we can do all that. Um, fortunately, there's some dollars, there's new dollars that are coming from the feds and also new dollars from the state that are going to make this a little easier. Uh, but these are, these are big, big, interwoven challenges and, and you know, I, I try to tackle them, but um, there's a lot, a lot of work here to do. So um, that kind of really is a good segue into what's happening across the country. Um, you know, racial and social justice uh, um, is at the forefront of a lot of people's minds right now. Um, I know that there was a policing bill that was um, a legislation that's been um, uh, passed through the state. Um, what is the thought and, and some of the information that you have that surrounds the this very large in your face problem that we keep kicking a can down the road. Um, you know, give us, you know, some indication of, of what's happening in the state 
surrounding racial justice and, and perhaps right here in our own backyards? So, you know, at, at the state level, when it comes to racial equity, uh, we actually have a newly created committee, um, the Joint Committee on, on Racial Equity, uh, in Inclusion and Diversity. Um, and this is really tasked with taking a look at existing laws and policies um, that, that may and do have racial bias in them and figuring those out and also creating a bit of a roadmap for where the Commonwealth needs to go um, in, in, in really addressing racial injustice. I'm the vice chair of that committee, actually, a, a position I'm, I'm excited to have. Um, kind of closer to home, you know, I'm proud of this police reform bill that we passed into law. This is really putting um, civilian overs oversight kind of at the head of police training. But what's really important here and that I, that I don't want to get lost is we need to make sure that we're funding this municipal police training. Too often, uh, and, and town level folks will appreciate this, the state will, will pass a law that, that's, that's a mandate, but if it's not funded, it's effectively an unfunded mandate and it's not gonna happen. And so as we're beginning to work through the FY22 budget process, I've got my eye on saying, all right, you know, we passed police, police reform that we can be proud of here in Massachusetts, but if we don't back this up, if we don't provide stable revenue stream for you know, police training, well, you know, that implicit bias training ain't gonna happen, right? That bystander training ain't gonna happen. Um, you know, all the various things that we want to, um, you know, really give to police departments and, and a whole host of other challenges, right? If you don't fund it, it's not gonna happen. So, so th those are sort of the two areas I'm focused. There's a myriad of other, you know, spaces and, 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 and areas here, um, but, but I'm, I'm focusing on those two at the moment. Again, so much happening at the State House. Is there other things that you want to discuss today that um, really are, are sometimes get lost in the fray of some of the bigger, uh, you know, headlines that are out there? Tell us what else is going on. Um, we also moved very quickly uh, in the Senate and in the House to pass uh, a relief package for uh, those who are unemployed, uh, for small businesses. Um, and, and also around paid leave. So this, this is a big deal. Uh, we passed a series of reforms to make the unemployment uh, insurance system whole again. Um, that actually, there, there's, there's still some concern about that. So, so the law that we passed didn't actually take into account um, what's, what's a, a, a solvency fee that's charged on employers. And so we were able to sort of keep the unemployment rate from increasing. But the, the, the solvency fund fee has, has risen astronomically, right? So I'm hearing from a whole, a whole host of small businesses who, you know, were expecting to receive maybe a, a relatively smaller sort of several thousand dollar bill, uh, you know, and it's increased 114%. So we've got to figure that out. Uh, but we also, the legislative, the legislative package also included um, loan um, uh, forgiveness, tax forgiveness around PPP loans. Uh, and then most importantly included, uh, you know, um, leave, sick leave for uh, anyone who needs it related to COVID. Really, unfortunately, the governor um, tried to strike that provision and sent that language back for amendment. And so we're, we're still working on this in the state house. But, you know, from a small business unemployment and, and worker perspective, we've really been trying to advance, uh, advance those suite of um, initiatives. I think several of them have been successful. Uh, one of them has had a bit of an unintended consequence, this, the, the solvency fund piece that we're trying to figure out. Uh, because, you know, too many small businesses just aren't able to, you know, foot, foot a quarter one bill that, that's due in a matter of weeks um, with such a hefty price tag. So lots of various different issues we're, we're chewing on and working on and, and trying to keep up. Um, you know, I, I think the vaccine, uh, the vaccination was, was, was pretty intense. I mean, the past, the past year has been tough. But the past several months have been, you know, an avalanche. Uh, you know, my office has, I think, last I checked, there's 687 voicemails that we've received just in the past maybe 10, 12 days. Um, I've got an awesome team, but there's only five of us. So, you know, it's a real challenge to get through all of those. So um, we're, we're, we're working to, we're working to stay afloat, but it, it certainly has been um, a challenging time to serve, but I definitely uh, feel honored to be able to serve at such a consequential time. All right. As, as folks uh, start to get vaccinated, um, we've we've started this game uh, internally with uh, some folks that we work together or that our families or friends. What are the things that you've missed the most that you're going to do once you're fully vaccinated? So once I'm fully vaccinated, my family's fully vaccinated. I, I think just spending time with my, my family indoors. I, I haven't been doing that. I, I see my parents 
Um, and, and my sister and sister-in-law and my nephew live in Brewster. And so my whole family's here and we've been seeing each other, but, but not sort of indoors and, and we're, we're restaurant people, right? So, so our sort of natural inclination is to, you know, have a big long meal and, and we haven't been doing that. So I'm really looking forward to that. Um, you know, but, but most of my favorite activities uh, that are coming up, especially in the summertime, these are very COVID safe activities, right? I, I can't wait to get get to the beach. I'm, I'm a native Cape Cotter, so I will I will get in the water in May. It's a, it's a point of pride for me. Um, but those sort of activities, a lot of things I'm looking forward to actually, um, you know, this summer are outdoors, but certainly going to be nice to to sit down and have a big, big family dinner. My, my parents have been uh, re renovating their kitchen through this. Uh, so we, we should have a big, big Sear family celebration once everyone's vaccinated. That's fantastic. Well, to. we thank you, as always, for all of your hard work on behalf of the residents of uh, Barnstable and all of Cape Cod and the islands. Uh, we know that it has been a tremendously long 18 months. Um. Yeah, you know it, Paula. You too. You've been incredible. And the town of Barnstable and, and, and the staff re really, you know, rising to the occasion time and again, particularly with this latest spike. Um, some, some really tremendous outreach to, to folks who typically uh, are left out. I think that's really something you and, and the team in Barnesville should be proud of. So thank you for that. Thank you. And we'll talk to you next month.